Good morning. My name is Assistant Chief Bill Cook. I, along with the men and women of the Rochester Hills Fire Department, welcome you all to our annual September 11th Remembrance Ceremony. I thank you all for setting aside time from your everyday busy schedule and for taking a moment to reflect upon the events that took place 16 years ago on September 11th, 2001. That day has changed our lives forever. The morning of September 11th, 2001 began like any other day. All of us were busy preparing for the day's activities and settling into our tasks as we received word that an airplane had crashed into the World Trade Center. My first thoughts were the plane must be small, like a single engine plane we commonly see above our heads. But as the details began to become clearer, we soon realized this was a tragedy that would remain in our memories for the rest of our lives. At eight, at 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11, with a crew of 11 and 76 passengers, was flown into the North Tower of the World Trade Center by terrorists. The tower remained standing for 102 minutes, then collapsed at 10.28 a.m. At 9.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175, with a crew of nine and 51 passengers, was flown into the South Tower of the World Trade Center by terrorists. This tower remained standing for 56 minutes and collapsed before the North Tower at 9.59 a.m. At 9.37 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77, with a crew of six and 53 passengers, was flown into the Pentagon by terrorists, creating a separate disaster in Arlington, Virginia. And at 10.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 93 with a crew of seven and 33 passengers crashed into the ground near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, after passengers on the flight attempted to subdue terrorists. Nearly 3,000 victims lost their lives in these terrorist attacks. These four events created chaos, panic, and terror to the likes that many of us have never experienced. Firefighters, emergency service personnel, and citizens were tasked with many situations they never dreamed of having to face. These individuals, knowing their brothers and sisters of humanity had perished, were able to maintain composure and complete the task at hand. Today, we are here to honor all of the first responders who paid the supreme sacrifice, those who worked through the stress of these attacks, and celebrate them in our memories. The 9-11 attacks are one of the worst known events in U.S. history and always <coughs> will be remembered for that. Let this memorial here at our fire station headquarters provide us with a daily reminder to take nothing for granted, to cherish time with our friends and family, count your blessings, and to respect the freedoms we have as fellow Americans. Now I'd like to take a moment to thank our elected officials for attending this morning. We have with us Senator, State Senator Marty Nolenberg, State Representative Michael Weber, Mayor Brian K. Barnett, City Council President Mark Tisdale, City Council Vice President Stephanie Morita, City Council Members Dr. Susan Boyer, Mr. Kevin Brown, Mr. Jim Kubasina, and Mr. Dale Hetrick. Thank you all for attending this special event. We appreciate all of your commitments to prioritizing public safety and in honoring this day. I'd also like to thank uh, and recognize our emergency service partners in the Oakland County Sheriff's Office who's here today. We appreciate your commitment to public safety as well. Now, if you would all please rise for the posting of our colors and the singing of the national anthem by Sydney Ryba from the Stony Creek High School.
say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the Thank you, Sydney. Please be seated. Now with our opening comments, I'd like to welcome Mayor Brian Barnett to the podium. Good morning. Certainly, I want to echo the thanks of Assistant Chief Cook in welcoming all of you and thanking you for being here today and joining us uh, at the place where our community honors the memory of that truly unforgettable day 16 years ago. A day that so dramatically changed our nation and for many of us, frankly, our worldview. <clears throat> where were you on that morning? I know all of you remember, I do. I was at a previous employer in Troy at my job at my desk when a colleague raced in with what seemed to be unbelievable news. Our small office team of eight then spent the next probably four hours huddled around a small TV, shaking our heads, crying, and generally just standing in complete disbelief. How could this actually be happening in America? That moment was my generation's President Kennedy shooting was a moment that shaped a generation and truly defined a decade. However, as, as we all know, what was intended to make our country weak, in fact, made us stronger in many respects. As we were awakened in more ways than one that morning, patriotism flooded our streets and our hearts. The displays of courage and determination in our first responders created a newfound and much deserved appreciation for those that serve our country and our communities. A spirit on display again last week in Texas and last night in Florida. When common sense says escape, courageous first responders here only enter. When elected leaders impose curfews and encourage residents to flee north, brave first responders fly south. When forecasters demand civilians hunker down and stay inside, first responders prepare to stay the night in cars, and boats, trees, and outside the very shelters designed to protect their neighbors. It is an uncommon calling. A calling answered not by the masses, but by quiet heroes who know there is something greater about sacrifice and service than most of us will ever understand. The steel beam that sits behind me, that once stood hundreds of feet in the air in the New York sky, finds its final resting place here as a quiet and constant reminder of the thousands of people who lost their lives, but also the hundreds 
that risked theirs that day to answer that common, that uncommon and heroic call. This morning, friends, our challenge is twofold. That we appropriately pause to honor those who died and to keep their spirit alive for future generations to remember the sacrifice of those that tried to save them. But just as important, and in that same piece of quiet and determined steel, that we would recognize heroes are still among us today and every day, and that this memorial would serve as a place where we will continue to honor our firefighters, police officers, EMS professionals, and the military personnel who continue to serve our country so selflessly. We, here in Rochester Hills, well, we are grateful for everyday heroes, and we will never forget those whose number was called 16 years ago today. May God bless our freedom and all of those who protect it, and may God continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you, Mayor Barnett. I would like to now introduce State Senator Marty Nolenberg. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts. When I was younger, I remember older adults saying how everyone remembered the exact moment that they heard President Kennedy had been killed. I never really fully understood that expression until 9-11. The news burned the moment into our collective memory. For me, I remember where I was. I was at the Birmingham YMCA, just finishing up a swim, and I remember being mesmerized by the TV set in the men's locker room. And as I you know, gathered my things and headed towards the hallway, the people were gathered by another TV set and to me, that was, I'll never forget that moment. And, and that moment has been impregnated ever since. And I'm sure many of you have similar stories as well. And in that instant, learning of 9-11, we experienced several emotions at the same time. One, obviously, was shock. Now, how could this happen here on American soil? Up to that moment, the evil world had been kept at a distance. And we could choose to engage in it or not. Now this was no choice. It was thrust upon our homeland, forcing us to change our interaction within our borders as it relates to security. The second emotion was sadness. Nearly 3,000 of our fellow Americans had suddenly been killed, their families shattered, children no longer had a mother or a father, the guiding force in their lives was suddenly gone, forever. A third emotion was anger. We were united as a country in our anger and a desire to see that justice be done. The final emotion was love. As we saw the courage of our first responders, it reminded us of the greatness of our people the firefighters, police officers, paramedics, and average citizens running toward danger to serve their fellow Americans. And a number of you are here today, and thank you for coming. All of these emotions experienced at once are the hot iron that burned the moment of 9-11 into our memories. And for me, I will never forget. We will never forget. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you, Senator Nolenberg. Now I'd like to welcome State Representative Michael Weber to the podium. Good morning, everyone. It's truly an honor to serve uh, the greater Rochester area and the Michigan House of Representatives. And it's also uh, was an honor to serve on the Rochester Hills City Council. Uh, last week, I was talking to a colleague of mine in the House and we were noting that more and more of these communities are not holding 9-11 remembrance ceremonies like the one that we're at here right now. And so I'm proud to live in a community where we will never forget. 
We will never forget what happened on 9-11, and we will never forget where we were that day. I certainly will never forget. I was, like I said last year, I was in Washington, D.C. on 9-11. On this day, we reflect on the tremendous service of our first responders and what they did on 9-11 and what they do for us every single day. Each year, the Michigan House of Representatives holds a ceremony, and we did again last Thursday, um, around 9-11, where we honor first responders. And we particularly honor those that we've lost over the last year. Chief Canto and Assistant Chief Cook has joined me for this ceremony in the past, and others from the city of Rochester as well. This year in particular, we give thanks to our first responders who are working so hard to keep people safe in Texas and in Florida during this hurricane recovery. These states need our help and assistance. Thank you to our fire department and our sheriff's substation for keeping us safe here in Rochester Hills. We honor you on this day. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Weber. I'd now like to introduce City Councilman Kevin Brown. Well, thank you to Chief Canto, Assistant Chief Cook for the opportunity to speak today. And thank all of you for joining us as we commemorate September 11th. Whenever I stop and think about our first responders, I'm always reminded of a conversation I had on board uh, a surface ship in Italy back in 1997. I was serving as a division officer on board the USS Toledo, and we had the opportunity to join the surface ship for lunch. Since it was much larger and more comfortable than the submarine, several of us arrived early. We sat and talked for a while when we heard the general alarm, an announcement of fire. All the submariners in the room st stood up and looked to the other officers <clears throat> to, for help in finding the firefighting equipment and the location of the fire. Since the submarine crews were small, everyone on board became part of the firefighting and damage control team, and we all typically went to the fire. Our hosts on the surface ship had a good laugh, told us all to sit back down, that their fire team was drilling that morning, and even if it was a real fire, it was their job to take care of it. They had a fire team that took care of things like that. I didn't really think much of it, other than it was a funny story from our deployment. But as I recall the events of September 11th and the situation our Rochester Hills firefighters and Oakland County sheriffs face every day, it reminds me that this instinct is not normal. We actually teach our children to do the opposite. We tell them to have an exit plan and a meeting place to get out of their house if there's a fire. We have drills at schools and office buildings to leave in an orderly fashion and meet in some designated location in the parking lot. But on 9-11, what we saw on TV that morning were police and firefighters rushing to downtown New York, risking their lives to help others, and in some cases going inside a burning building on the verge of collapse. We saw firsthand the amazing bravery and heroism of our first responders. And even though thousands of lives were lost, there were many that were saved because of their actions. Most people on 9-11 um, associate it with the beginning of America's war on terror and focus on the nearly 3,000 lives lost and 6,000 wounded that day. This is my generation's Pearl Harbor. Although we never forget this, we'll never forget this terrible tragedy and the lives lost and families impacted, I suggest that we should also remember the amazing actions and events that were part of the recovery. In the days that followed, we witnessed a country and a world that forgot about all of the things that make us different. And we united together to help victims and fight back against terrorism around the world. 16 years, years later, we're standing here at the Rochester Hills Fire Department headquarters, station number one. And as I look out at all the firefighters and police, I think 
that every single day, sometimes more than once a day, these men and women put themselves in situations that most of, most of us would walk or run away from. And they do it to help complete strangers. These are the men and women that truly make this a great city, community, and nation. We see examples of this in Texas and in Florida in their hurricane response efforts. So today, as we all go back to work and remember that our team of Rochester Hills firefighters and the Oakland County Sheriff's Department are here in our community answering the 911 calls and rushing in to an uncertain, often dangerous situation to help us. It happens thousands of times a year in Rochester Hills and it rarely makes the news. But we owe this team of our local heroes our gratitude and thanks for all that they do for us every day. It's the least we can do to take a moment of our lives just to say thank you to the men and women in uniform that you see in our community. Thank you and God bless our first responders. God bless Rochester Hills and the United States of America. Thank you, Councilman Brown. Now I'd like to welcome City Councilman Dale Hetrick to the podium. Good morning, distinguished guests, and especially the men and women of the Rochester Hills Fire Department. As I reflected on the September 11th ceremony from previous years, Several thoughts came to mind. I would like to share some of them with you this morning. The men and women who, who choose to become firefighters make a commitment which they live up to every day. During the graduation ceremony, Rochester Hills firefighter cadets state they are driven to be the best. Underpinning their motto is a commitment to face whatever situation confronts them with tenacity and vigor. When an alarm sounds, our firefighters don't know what challenge they will face. They will deliver their best in any emergency to save the lives of our citizens, even if it means the ultimate sacrifice, losing their life. Driven to be the best is a commitment among all Rochester Hills emergency personnel, demonstrating pride in their profession and concern for everyone who's associated with the city. I know the firefighters in New York demonstrate the same driven to be the best commitment. I'm certain they're also fully prepared to handle any challenge that confronts them and save the lives of every resident and visitor to New York. On September 11, 2001, the men and women of the New York Fire Department likely prepared for the day as they always do. Equipment, fire trucks, ambulances, everything ready for when the city needs them. Of course, they didn't know what was about to unfold that morning. There's no doubt when the first plane flew into the World Trade Center, the men and women of the New York Fire Department quickly mobilized to take on an unthinkable task. Head directly into the teeth of a significant tragedy and save as many lives as they can, while recognizing many of their own could perish. Despite chaos, turmoil, and considerable uncertainty, the brave New York firefighters went well beyond the call of duty to save thousands of victims. Their unrelenting commitment to be the best and do whatever was necessary to save the lives <clears throat> is worthy of our recognition for the veracity of their conviction and the families they saved. As we commemorate our firefighters for their undisputable service on 9-11, I will challenge you to consider this thought today and throughout the year. When you hear a siren setting in motion our firefighters, consider their commitment to be the best. And think about the meaning of the siren, a life will be saved. Recognizing the New York City Fire Department, the Rochester Hills Fire Department, and fire departments across the country will be worth the moment of reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Hetrick. 
Now please welcome Deacon John Wright with the St. Irenaeus Church. Obviously, we've all enjoyed the wonderful prepared remarks. Um, I'm going to have some help from Scripture to help with a couple of remarks because that always is something that we rely on. This is a reading from Luke chapter 5. One day, as Jesus was teaching, Many were sitting there and had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him for healing. And some men brought on a stretcher a man who was paralyzed. They were trying to bring him in and set him in his presence. But not finding a way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on the stretcher through the tiles in the middle in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, As for you, your sins are forgiven. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your stretcher, and go home. He stood up immediately before them, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home, glorifying God. Then astonishment seized them all, and they glorified God, and struck with awe, they said, We have seen incredible things today. As we hear, this is the prepared remarks, but as we hear this part of Luke's Gospel, we can pick out the main characters that we are used to hearing. Jesus, of course who was surrounded in a crowded place, teaching what they need to hear. Then the man known as the paralytic on the stretcher is someone we are drawn to. He needs help, and Jesus interrupts what he is doing to heal him. It's a great story, great scripture for us to pray with. However, today, in honor of those first responders that happened those 16 years ago and still happens today, we ought to focus on those who carried the paralytic on the stretcher and found a way to help him get in front of Jesus. Those are the people I often think of when I happen to read this gospel. Today we pray, keeping those people in mind keeping all those people in mind that were first responders and went out of their way, maybe were interrupted in their lives, went out of their way, and what they do? They climbed a roof, took a piece out of the roof, and lowered that paralytic in so he could be healed. Those who responded on 9-11 many years ago and our firefighters and emergency technicians and police officers and those who assist others that's who we can think of when we think of those men that carried that paralytic in that place. So think about those people. Think about though the healing that Jesus brought and the way that Jesus kept his life alive in some way. Even those we think of that died that day and that are dying today as we go through that, they still live in some fashion. So we bow our heads and pray for God's blessing. Blessed are you, Lord, God of mercy, who through your Son gave us a marvelous example of charity and the great commandment of love for one another. Send down your Spirit on all of these servants here and those who work here and those that were first responders 16 years ago and are still first responders now who so generously devote themselves to helping others. When they are called and their lives as Jesus' life was interrupted to assist people in times of need, send your spirit to faithfully serve our neighbors in need or in danger. 
We ask for these gifts today as we remember all that have been focused on that work and that went through that work 16 years ago. And we hope that that work continues in honor of those men that carried the paralytic in to see you, in honor of all those people that went through roofs and go through places that may not be safe to help other people. Please help them to get in front of those folks and get in front of our Lord Jesus and in God our Father to help them be healed. And we say together, Amen. Thank you, Deacon Wright. <clears throat> the signal 5555 has been used in the city of New York firehouses since 1870. It signals a death, generally of a colleague, and tells firefighters to lower the American flag to half staff. Before computers, dispatchers communicated with firehouses using a series of rings and gave the location of a blaze by a code assigned to the nearest intersection. A house watchman had to monitor the bells and decipher the message on paper. These days a watchman monitors a computer screen which gives the code for the intersection, the address, and the type of incident. The bells have been disabled but the 5555 signal is still used. To this day the code still has meaning. A dispatcher will say on the radio, a signal 5555 has been transmitted and it is with regret that the department announces the death of a firefighter. Today, the Rochester Hills Fire Department will sound the signal 5555 in honor of the members of the City of New York Fire Department, the New York City Police Department, and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. 411 emergency service personnel who lost their lives 16 years ago today. Rest easy, brothers and sisters. Now will you all please rise for the honoring of the colors and the playing of taps by Angelo Grappito from Stony Creek High School.
Please be seated. Now I'd like to welcome the Chief of Fire and Emergency Services for the City of Rochester Hills, Chief Sean Canto. Good morning. I take no credit to uh, what I'm about to read. I found this story online, but I think it's very relevant uh, today. When the planes hit the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, Father Micah Judge ran into the North Tower alongside the firemen he served. Not long after, he became the first recorded victim of the terrorist attacks. But 10 years later, his friends and colleagues remember Judge vividly in his death as they knew him in life. A gregarious man, who wholly devoted to God, whom many considered a saint. From the first, Mike Judge loved to be where the action is. His friend and fellow friar, Michael Duffy, remembers an episode when they were both young Franciscan priests in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Judge heard that a man had locked himself in an attic of a home and was threatened to shoot his wife and baby. Soon after Michael Duffy arrived at the scene, there were police cars, fire trucks, TV crews, and a figure climbing up a ladder in the attic. Who was on the ladder? Duffy laughs, Father Michael Judge, and in his habit. The priest was in his long brown robe with sandals, climbed in the window and disappeared. They waited five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, sweating bullets, waiting for gunshots, Duffy recalled. The next thing he knew, 20 minutes later, the front door opened and out comes the wife holding the baby and the man with the guy and Michael Judge with his arm around him. So it was no surprise when Judge moved to the Priory across the street from the firehouse on West 34th Street, one of New York City's busiest fire stations. He became the department chaplain in 1992. Craig Monahan, a retired firefighter, remembers Judge as a strapping guy with big hands, thick white hair. He had a deep voice, like a man's man. Monahan said, I could picture him chopping down a door with an ax. He would love to do that. He would love to get involved with their drills, practicing with the Halligan Bar, swinging and breaking the door or something. He fit right in with the crews. Another firefighter, Jimmy Boyle, agrees that Father Mike Judge was one of the boys, but not when he performed religious ceremonies. He'd come in the firehouse, have a cup of coffee, have a meal, listen to all the talk, watch the ball game, hear all the problems, and talk about anything you want. But when he had mass in the firehouse, he always felt when he got to the Eucharist, he transformed himself. He became Christ-like. He was just so pious. All within the divine plan. Judge said, had a fierce conviction that all would be well. Still, in the few months of his life, they noticed a shadow came over him. He knew he was going to die, says Father Christopher Keenan, a fellow Franciscan priest who took over the chaplaincy after September 11th attacks. He knew something was coming. He said to me two different times, Chrissy, the Lord's going to be here coming for me. Keenan said he received what seemed like a farewell note a few days before the terrorist attacks. And at a mass in the firehouse on September 10th, in what turned out to be the last homily, Michael Judge reminded his firefighters that in the midst of the danger, God is near. It's fantastic how I can tell you sometimes a day begins and goes through a day, he said, but not to realize that everything that happens, every single thing that happens is somehow within a divine plan, Keene said. Judge didn't want to grow old and feeble. That final morning, in the morning of September 11, 2001, Judge rushed with some of the off-duty firefighters to the World Trade Center, who had just been hit by the first plane. Thomas Van Essen, who was then the fire commissioner in New York City, saw him in the North Tower, and he really looked concerned. Van Essen recalls, we didn't talk. We always talk, we always fooled around, but we didn't that morning. As it happened, a French documentary filmmaker were inside the North Tower. Their camera captured some of the last moments of Michael Judge's life. In the film, his friends, Father Michael Duffy, says you can see the priest standing by the plate glass windows, watching the bodies fall the patio outside. If you look at him closely, you'll see his lips moving, Duffy says. None of those, or, excuse me, now for those of us who knew him, he wasn't talking to himself. He was praying and absolving people as they fell to their death. Moments later, the South Tower collapsed. The explosion shattered the windows and flung the priest's body across the lobby. In the darkness, some firemen stumbled over his body. 
said it's Father Mike, they yelled. They lifted up his limp body, gently placed him in a chair. As they carried him outside, a photographer snapped the photograph of the developing tragedy in his body. Five individuals took his body and laid it upon the altar at St. Peter's Cathedral prior to taking him to the medical examiner's office. Today we celebrate the lives of the 411 emergency responders that were lost 16 years ago today. Since that time, an additional 159 New York City firefighters have died from health complications directly related to September 11th. After the playing of Amazing Grace, I ask for you to join us in placing the 411 American flags around our memorial in their remembrance. <laughs>